Hello and welcome to another monthly Focus on a Feature online tutorial using the Integrated Genome Browser. My name is Dr. Nolan Fries and I will once again be your host for today. Now during one of the last Focus on a Features we talked about using IGBE to visually analyze RNA-seq data that we had generated using Galaxy. So today I thought we could follow a similar approach for analyzing ChIP-seq data, another popular high-throughput sequencing technique analyzing genome-wide protein-DNA interactions. Now ChIP-seq or chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing is a technique often used to identify transcription factor binding locations. This is done by fixing protein to DNA, followed by shearing of that DNA, and then using an antibody to actually pull out the protein or transcription factor of interest, which is still attached to that DNA. And then we can take that DNA and sequence it using next-gen sequencing. So this sequence file that we'll get back, so this FASTQ file, then needs to be aligned to a reference genome and areas of protein DNA binding, otherwise known as peak calling, can be identified. So today I'll be covering how to use Galaxy to assemble your ChIP-seq data using a program called Bowtie. We will then use the program Max to call peaks. Then we will visualize all of the ChIP-seq data in IGBE looking for protein DNA binding. Then as an added bonus, I thought it would be fun, uh, there's an accompanying RNA-seq data set to our ChIP-seq data set. So after we've identified genes being bound by the transcription factor, we can then look at the RNA-seq data to see if there is a change in expression when we actually knock out that transcription factor. So as usual, our use of both Galaxy and IGBE today will require no programming experience and both are free to use. So today's openly available data set comes from a paper looking at the expression of the DNA binding transcription factor SOX9, and this work was carried out in mice. And so if you want to look at this data set yourself, it can be found at NCBI's sequence read archive. Okay, so today we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in Galaxy. Galaxy is a web-based platform for analyzing lots of different data types, and it's broken kind of into three main parts. So over here on the left, we're gonna have our tools pane. And so you'll see me coming over here to select the different tools that we're gonna use. And then once I've selected that tool, uh, it'll the options for it will appear here in the middle. And so we'll be able to change you know, our options for whatever we wanna do and then start our analysis. And once we've started that analysis, it will appear over here in our history. And so here you can see I've already um, run several different analyses, and now that they're completed, they're all green. So the data sets that we're going to work with today I've already imported into Galaxy, and I use this using the get data tool. So there's a number of different ways to input data, and I use the EBI SRA to pull in those sequence read archive files. Now the two files that we're going to be working with are the ChIP-seq input DNA and the ChIP-seq SOX9. So the SOX9 data set is from carrying out ChIP-seq using an antibody against SOX9, and this can be considered our treatment. So if you hear me say the SOX9 data set or the treatment data set, those are going to be the same things. Now the input DNA is a little bit different from that ChIP-seq in that there was no antibody used against SOX9. So this is just kind of the raw input DNA. And so this is going to act as our control. So if you hear me say input DNA or control, those are kind of synonymous. Uh, and that control is going to help us get rid of some false positives later in our analysis. As always, the first thing that you're going to want to do is run your FASTQ files through the FASTQC program. Now FASTQC will run a number of analyses to give you an idea as to the quality of your sequence. You can find FASTQC under the NGS toolbox and then QC and manipulation. And it should be this FASTQC read QC here. And so you'll just want to input your file and then go ahead and execute it. And I've already done this for both of our files, both the input and the SOX9. So if we take a look at that real quick. Uh, so other than looking at the general quality of the FASTQ sequence, which is one of the, the main uses of FASTQC, which this data is OK for the most part. It has a few issues. Um, if you look at the quality scores. But what we really want to get out of this are two pieces of information that we're going to need later. So that is the sequence length here, which is 36. 
as well as the quality score encoding, which you can see here is Illumina 1.5. The, the encoding is important because Galaxy needs to know what format your data are in. Uh, so for our next step, we're going to use that information to groom our raw data so that Galaxy can actually work with it properly. So to do this, we're going to go back to our toolbox. I'm going to go to the QCN manipulation again. And then we're going to look for a program called FastQ Groomer. Now for this FastQ Groomer, you're going to select your FastQ file. And then for the input FastQ quality score type, we're going to change that to Illumina 1.3 to 1.7, since we know our data is Illumina 1.5 currently. And then you can go ahead and click Execute. And once again, you'll want to do that for both files. So this will generate a nearly identical data set to the original FastQ file, but now the quality scores have all been set in such a way that Galaxy can work with them. Now that we've quality checked our data and it's properly groomed, we can go ahead and align it to a reference genome. So in order to do this, what we're going to use is a tool called Bowtie, which is a short read aligner. Bowtie can be found, once again, in the NGS toolbox. And we're going to go to NGS Mapping. And then we're going to select a map with Bowtie for Illumina. Now you'll notice that there is a Bowtie 2, which is a more recent version. However, several of the updates for it involve uh, longer reads and paired end data. And since our data is uh, single end and the reads are quite short, then we're not going to worry about that. So we'll just go with Map with Bowtie for Illumina. So what you'll want to do is use a built-in index, and we're going to select the mouse genome. That's what we want to align against. So this is, I'm going to select MM10. It's just the most recent uh, genome version for mouse. Our data is single end, and you'll want to choose your groomed data. And then we're just going to use the default settings. Other than that, we're not going to change anything else and then go ahead and execute this and do it for both your SOX9 and your input DNA data. So the output from Bowtie will be a SAM file. So here we can see that right here. Let's take a look at it really quick. So let's have some general information followed by your reads and where they mapped to. Now this file will actually include both mapped reads as well as unmapped reads. What we want to do is actually get rid of those unmapped reads because right now they're just kind of taking up space. So they're bloating our files a little bit um, and we just don't need them. So in order to get rid of those, we can go back to our NGS toolbox. We can go to SAM tools. So we're working with the SAM file. And then we can go to filter SAM. So we're going to select our Bowtie mapped. I'm just going to use the ChipSeq SOX9 SAM file. And then I'm going to add a new flag. And I want to get rid of our unmapped uh, read. So I'm going to go, the read is unmapped. And then I'm going to set the state for this flag as no. And then go ahead and execute that and execute it for both files. So both your ChipSeq SOX9 as well as ChipSeq input DNA. And what this is going to do is it's just going to go through there and take out all of those unmapped reads. And so if we look at the number of lines in our original SAM file, so this uh, here's the input DNA, it's 160 million lines. And then we compare that to our file with no unmapped reads, we can see we got rid of about 50 million uh, lines there. So we got rid of quite a few unnecessary reads. Okay, so now before we call peaks, let's go ahead and convert the bowtie data from SAM to BAM format. This will be important since we want to be able to view these reads in IGBY later, and the easiest way to do that is to use the BAM files. So all we need to do for that is come back to our toolbox, and then right back to SAM's tools, and then just click on this SAM to BAM, and this is going to convert that SAM format to BAM for format. So the only thing you'll need to change here is your, um, just make sure you have the bowtie map, chip seek, and here I've named them no unmapped read SAM files. And then go ahead and execute that and do that for both files. And so now you can see I have 
my two BAM files here, each for the ChIP-seq input DNA and for the SOX9. And so we'll be able to view those later. So now we can finally carry out our peak calling to see where the SOX9 transcription factor is binding. And so in order to carry out this peak calling, we're going to be using a program called MAX. Now MAX can be found over here once again in our toolbox in the NGS toolbox beta. And you're going to look for NGS peak calling and then select MAX. So MAX stands for Model Based Analysis of ChIP-Seq. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the aligned files that we've generated with Bowtie and it's going to look for regions where protein DNA binding has occurred. Now this can be done with or without a control sample, but using a control sample generally leads to some better results. Uh, this is due to certain regions of the genome preferentially amplifying with CHIP. So this, this in itself can lead to some bias and you can start getting some false positives. So if you use a control, um, it's, it's much easier to get rid of these false positives. So just keep that in mind, you know, when you're designing your experiments that, you know, this can really help clean up your data, but of course it is going to increase the amount of sequencing that you're going to have to do. Okay, so to run Max, we're going to need to change several settings. So um, you can name your experiment whatever you want and just leave it as Max and Galaxy. And our data is single end. Now for the ChIP-seq tag file, I'm going to select my bowtie mapped ChIP-seq SOX9, so my treatment, and I'm going to use the no unmapped reads, and I'm just going to use the BAM file. You could use either the BAM or the SAM, but I'm going to go ahead and use the BAM file. And then for the ChIP-seq control file, this is going to be our input DNA. So once again, I'm going to choose the bowtie map, and then it's going to be the ChIP-seq input DNA with no unmapped reads. Now the effective genome size is going to be 1.87 billion. Now this might sound a little weird to those of you who work in mice since you know that the mouse genome is actually closer to about 3 billion base pairs. But the effective genome size is defined as the genome size that can be sequenced and due to things like repetitive features this will actually be, or this will generally be between 70 to 90% of the total genome size. So you can either kind of calculate that based on whatever genome you're using, or a lot of the times there are kind of predetermined values. So for a mouse, this is a, a kind of just a, a set default. So the tag size we know from our FASTQC, we know that our sequence, uh, the read length was 36 base pairs. Uh, the bandwidth should be set to around what the fragment, le fragment length that was sequenced was. So if you don't know this, you'll need to talk to whoever created your um, libraries prior to sequencing. Or if you're coming off of um, data that's already been published, just try and find what fragment length they were using. So in our case, I know it was around 300, so I'm just going to leave that as a default value. Now the p-value cutoff defines the significance a peak has to reach in order to not be discarded. So the lower the p-value, the less peaks we will get, but the greater likelihood that they are true peaks. So I'm just going to leave this value at the default. It should be perfectly good. The next value is the m-fold. And what this is is a ratio of the peaks to the background uh, or control. Now it's used in building a model estimating the actual size of the peaks. And in Galaxy, Max requires that a set number of peaks be used to build this model. So the default value is 32, and that means that a peak will only be considered to build the model if it is 32 times enriched compared to the background. But if not enough peaks are found, then Max can fail. Uh, it, it will just return an error to you. Um, so for this particular example, if you run it with an m-fold of 32, Max won't find enough peaks that um, it's able to use to build that model, and so it'll just return an error. And so in this case, I actually had to bring it down to 10, so 10 times, and that's a perfectly good number, um, or it's perfectly acceptable. So the only other options that we're going to change, uh, we're going to make, or we're going to save the WIG file. So we'll be able to take a look at that later. And then we are going to perform the new peak detection method. And this is just a slightly more thorough 
um, way of calculating local bias when calculating uh, these peaks. So go ahead and click Execute. And what this will do is it'll generate four files. We have the peaks embed file here. And this is going to have the peaks and their associated scores. And then we have two WIG files, one for the treatment and one for the control. And then we have an HTML report. And let's take a look at that really quick. So this HTML report has a lot of information about just how Max was run. So you can see all of the values that we input and how we ran it, as well as some additional files. And there's actually some good information in these files that are worth taking a look at. So this models.pdf, this actually shows kind of what I was talking about before. So this is these are the uh, models of where the peaks on the positive and negative strands fell. So Max is going to use this to create that a model of where the actual peak should fall. For sequencing, we expect the reads to kind of fall across this peak, but that we're going to sequence it on the forward tag or in the forward direction, you know, this direction. So it's going to fall a little to the left. And then on the, the reverse sequence or reverse tag, we're going to sequence it this direction. And so it's going to fall a little to the right. And so then our actual peak will be somewhere in between. And we can actually see this in action once we take a look at it in Igby. Now if I go back, so the model.r, this is the actual model that was used to generate that PDF. And you can view this in the statistical program R uh, if you needed to. And then the two peaks files, these are XLS files, which provide some additional informa information regarding each peak, uh, including its summit. So these would be really important for conducting downstream statistical analyses on your data. But we're not going to worry about them today as we're really concentrating on visual analysis. So one of the main files that we really want to work with now is this peaks embed file. And so it's a pretty simple embed file where we just have our location and then a score. And the score is the negative log of the p-value. So the higher the score, the more significant the peak is. So if we want to get a good feel for the distribution of these scores, which will actually help us here in a little bit, we can go ahead and do some summary statistics on them. So Galaxy provides uh, some really easy tools for conducting some uh, statistics on this. Okay, so we're interested in this fifth column. And so what we want to do is go to statistics and then look at our summary st statistics. And so we want to carry this out on our bed file, so the max uh, peaks bed file. And then we want to do it for our C5, which stands for column 5. So go ahead and click Execute. Then if we also want to take a look at maybe how this would graph, we can make a histogram for it. So over here in the tools, go to Graph Display Data, and then click on Histogram. And then here, once again, choose your peaks bed file, and then choose column five. I'm just going to give it 100 breaks or 100 bars. Um, I mean, change this to negative log of the p value, and we want to plot this as a frequency. So I'm then just go ahead and click execute. Here's our summary statistics. So we know the mean of our peak scores around 90. Um, and we can see that our lowest value is cut off at 50, and then our highest is at about 3,000. And that the majority of our data really falls between about uh, 50 or 60 and 100. And then we can just see that in this histogram really quickly that our data falls, you know, so here around 50, and pretty much all of our data ends at about 3 or 400. Okay, so now we've got our peaks bed file, and we've got a good idea of how our data is spread out. So now we can finally go ahead and start looking at this in Igby. So as long as you have Igby already running, and if you haven't downloaded Igby yet, just go to biobiz.org and click on the download now. And then once you've got Igby running, in Galaxy, all you need to do is go to your bed file and click on it and then come down here to display an Igby. 
and then just click on view. And so this page will pop up and if you switch back to Igby, you just trust the certificate and click on OK. And so what Igby will do is it'll load the correct genome and genome version and it will load in our peak subbed file track. So to quickly familiarize ourselves with Igby, if you haven't used it before, we can see that we've got our data loaded in, and then we've got two tracks here, so the, the reference genome tracks, and these are split into the positive and negative strand. Over here on the right, we've got all of our chromosomes, so we can jump between them. Uh, if we want to zoom in or out, there's a lot of different ways to control this, but you can use the horizontal zoom slider here. Or additionally, you can highlight a region on this coordinates track and jump to that region. And this is all very fluid. But let's go ahead and load our data in. So Igby will not load these files automatically um, since many of them can be very large. So in our case, we know this, this peaks bed file is smaller, so I'm just going to go ahead and load it for the entire chromosome. And just to simplify this view, I'm also going to put uh, the positive and minus strands into one track. So if I go down to this data management table, I can see the data that I have loaded, and I can just put it all into uh, one strand. And then I'm actually going to take this file and drag it down here, just so it's at the bottom. OK. So we can tell that Max has found a lot of peaks, and it's actually several thousand. And we have a good idea of the range of those peaks in terms of their scores. But obviously what we're looking at here is just all of the peaks are spread across the chromosome, and we have no idea which ones are um, higher significance or lower significance. So if we wanted to visually separate peaks with a high score versus those with a low score, um, which would make them easier to differentiate between, we can use the color by option. So in order to do that, come over to the max track, right click on it, and then go down to color by. So we're interested in coloring this by its score. So I'm going to come down to score. And then this gives us the option to edit a heat map. So the first thing I want to do here is I want to set the range. So we know the range of my data is approximately 50 to about 300, or the majority of my data uh, falls between 50 to 300. And so Igby will de default to 1 in 1,000. So let's just go ahead and change this to 50 and 300. Click OK. And now we want the lower scores to kind of blend into the background and the higher score peaks to stand out a little bit. You know, maybe we want to be able to, you know, quickly go through the entire, all of our data and just pick out the really high scoring peaks, um, you know, kind of whatever analysis you want to do. And so what we can do is click on these arrows up here, if I double click on that, it's going to allow me to change the color. And so I'm just going to make that kind of a lighter blue. I'll do the same thing for both of these arrows, so both this one and this one. And then the two higher score arrows, I'm going to make a dark blue. So now our higher score values should show up in kind of this darker and lower score values in uh, the lighter blue. And you can always change this around however you want. Um, but this should be good for our purposes. So I'll click OK and click OK again. And now we can really quickly differentiate our lower score peaks versus our higher score peaks. So let's zoom in on a region and see where some of these peaks fall and what they look like. So I'm just going to go kind of right here in the middle. And I'm just dragging along the coordinates axis to zoom in. This one looks pretty good. OK, so this is a really good example. Uh, so here we have a gene, Serpent B5. I 
I have no idea what this gene does, but we can see that max is called a peak, and this peak fall is right at the beginning of this gene. And that's a pretty high score, so it's 340.24. Um, so we know this is probably a really good example of a, of a good peak, and most likely indicating that there is some sort of binding going on at this gene. So if we wanted to find out more about this gene, all you'd have to do is click on it, and then Igby allows you to right-click on that gene, and you can do a quick search. You can either Google it or go to NCBI. So I click on NCBI in this case and find out more information about it. So, you know, serine or cysteine peptidase inhibitor. And you know, here's lots of articles that mention it, which is, there's quite a few. Um, so, you know, this would just be a quick way to find out more about that gene. But if we want to look at the reads for this peak itself, maybe, so, you know, we trust that Max called this as a peak, but we want to actually look and see, you know, do the reads really line up right at this peak? Um, did Max, you know, actually do its job? Then we can go ahead and load in our reads, so the bowtie mapped BAM files that we had in Galaxy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back to Galaxy. And back in my history pane, I'm going to go down to my so bowtie mapped, and this is the oh, this is what I want the ChipSeq SOX9. So I can click on that file, and then I can just click on the display in Igby, or click on the view right next to it. And so Igby will start loading in this file. And once again, this file won't load right away. You'll have to click on load data. So here we can see we have a bunch of reads. I'm going to go ahead and also click on load sequence. This will load the sequence for this region. And then wherever our reads match that the reference sequence, you'll see that they turn blue here. Now, I'm actually going to change this a little bit. So we could actually, we can try and look at all of our reads at once. Um, if you click on this track, and then come down to annotation tab down here. We could try optimizing the number of reads that are shown by changing the stack height. So this gives us a pretty good indication that, okay, there's a lot of reads here. Another thing we can do, and I'm actually going to split this into the positive and minus strand. And then I'm going to create a depth graph. So this is just going to be a graph indicating the number of reads at this location. So I'm going to go depth graph and then hit go. And then I'll do the same thing for the negative strand. So depth graph, go. And then I can actually right click on this BAM file since I, I'm no longer interested in looking at it. And I can just go ahead and hide it for now. So this is going to give me some more space. And actually I'm going to click on this ref gene and I'm going to optimize it as well. Okay, so now we've got our two graphs. So these are depth graphs for our BAM file. So these are the ChIP-seq reads. And if we want to customize how these look, what we can do is go to the graph tab. So these are both graphs. And we can change things like their appearance. So I'm gonna change the uh, forward strand to red. We can also change kind of how the, the data is displayed. So if you want it as just a line or a bar, uh, in my case, I'm going to put it as a stair step. And then I'll do the same thing for the minus strand. And if we want to really be able to compare these, though, you'll notice that our y-axis here uh, for the positive strand goes to 30, and then for the minus strand goes to 60. So I want to put these on the same y-axis scale. So in order to do that, just click on one and then shift-click on the other to select both of them. And then still in the graph tab, come down here to the y-axis scale, and you can push this around. And as soon as you start to manipulate this, you'll see that they both uh, are on the same y-axis. And now we can take this a step further. If we come down here to the operations, we can actually join these together. And then we can collapse that track to put them 
on the same track together. And so this is really neat because here we can see, just like our PDF, pull it up really quick. So here's kind of the, the model that Max was using to predict our forward and reverse strands and then where that peak would fall. And here we can see that that's very similar for this peak. So we've got our forward reads and then our reverse reads here. And Max has called this peak right in the middle of this. So it's probably a good indication that this is, is a good peak call. Um, now, if we wanted to take a look at our input DNA, we can do that very quickly. Let's just jump right back to Galaxy. And then we can select the input DNA BAM file. Once again, go to Display in Igby. Click on View. I'll jump back to Igby. And give that a second to load in. And then click on Load Data. So I'm going to do the same thing for this BAM file. I'm going to create a depth graph for it. So click on the file, or click on this track, go to Annotations, and then in the single track, we're going to create a depth graph. And now we can hide this BAM file, just like we did the other BAM file. And so what we want to do now is make this comparative to our other graph. So if we go to graph, I'm actually going to change this to green so that we know it's different, make it stair step. And then what we'll want to do to add this graph to our other two graphs is we can actually select our joined graph here, come down to the graph tab, go to split, and now we can select all three graphs. You want to change the y-axis again, and then go ahead and join those and collapse them down. And so now we have a really good uh, kind of visual representation of our peaks and in comparison to our input DNA. And so, you know, this just provides kind of a, a good visual confirmation that Max is probably correct in calling a peak here and that, you know, maybe we would want to take a look at this gene some more or however you're conducting your analysis. So now let's say that I've also carried out RNA-seq to go along with my ChIP-seq data. So in this case, we actually have two RNA-seq data sets to go along with this ChIP-seq data set. And one is a control and one is a SOX9 knockout. So this is the protein that was probed for the ChIP-seq, if you recall. So this allows us to do some really neat analyses where we can look at our predicted peaks from the ChIP-seq analysis to determine potential genes that we think might be affected um, by this transcription factor, SOX9. And then we can look and see if expression of those genes is altered when SOX9 is knocked out. And this is really the power of IGB in that you can take lots of different data sets and stack them on top of each other and compare them. So to start off with, what I want to do is I'm going to kind of clear up some of these graphs that we're no longer going to be using. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to go back down to data access. And the only file that I want to keep is our original max bed file. So we can just clear out all the rest of these. OK, so we're back down to our reference genome and our max peaks. So our, I already have some idea of a candidate gene. You know, maybe I think that it or there's been previous evidence to suggest uh, that it's involved in something downstream of SOX9 or, or whatnot. Um, and in that case, the gene I'm going to look for is PAQR6. And so you can type that in into our search box here. And then this will allow you to jump right to it. And then we can zoom out a little bit and then go ahead, load our data for our the peak bed file. Okay, so we do have a peak here. I'm going to zoom in. I'm just going to drag along that coordinates track. So Max is also called a peak here, but you'll notice that this peak is very light blue, so it actually has a relatively low score of 55. Um, it's still significant, but it's it's not as high of a peak, 
or as significant of a peak as our last gene. So if we want to take a look and see, okay, well, how does this peak line up? You know, what does this peak look like? We could do the same analysis where we look at the BAM files for the reads and create depth graphs. Alternatively, in Galaxy, we had created our WIG files. So these WIG files will give us kind of a summary of our peaks, much like looking at those depth graphs. Now this file is quite sizable uh, and it's a non-indexed file. So I've already downloaded this file onto my computer. Um, and so in order to do that, just click on the download. And so all I need to do for that is drag that file directly in. And it'll take, it'd be a little bit to load it. So while that's loading, we can go ahead and grab our RNA-seq data sets. So I have already uh, run these in Galaxy. And this data is also freely available through the same uh, source. And if you want to know how I carried out the alignment of the RNA-seq data using Galaxy and a program called Top Hat, uh, please reference one of our uh, older focus on features from a few months ago where we covered how to do that. But for now I can go back to Galaxy and Galaxy allows you to save multiple histories. So in this case I'm going to jump to a different saved history and I have one called RNA-seq SOX9. And then you can see that I have my two RNA-seq BAM files. And so we can go ahead and just like before display an IGBY. So do the first one, and then I'll do the second one. So this is the SOX9 knockout, and then the SOX9 control RNA-seq data. Okay, so we'll give that a second to load that in. And then we can click on load data. Okay, so here is our peak wig file now. I'm going to drag that down and put it next to our peak. So you can see that Max called a peak here, and there, there does seem to be an increase in the reads at this location. It's not as high as maybe uh, the other more significant peak we were looking at, but it still is a, a significant peak. Now for the RNA-seq data, we want to do something Similar to what we did before, we want to be able to look at the reads and compare the reads between our knockout and our control. So we could just look at the reads themselves if I go down to the annotation tab and optimize it. But obviously that's going to be kind of kind of squish things down. So that's maybe not the best idea. So why don't we make a depth graph again? So I just click on this track and go down to depth graph. I'll make it for that one. And then I'll make it for the control as well. And then similarly, I can hide these two BAM files now. Right click, click on hide, and then I'll do the same thing for the control. So now very similar to before, if we wanted to compare these two, I'm going to go ahead and click on it, choose this, this graph track, and then go to graph. And I'm going to change the knockout to be red. And then I'll also make it a stair step. And then for the control, I'll leave it as blue, but also change it to stair step. And then this is where you want to remember you need to change these to put them on the same y-axis. So I'll click on the first one and then shift click to select the next one. And then as soon as you alter that y-axis, It'll put them both on the same axis, and then we can join them, and we can collapse them onto each other. This is a great way then to kind of visually look at this and say, okay, here's our gene. We know that max is called a peak here, and we can get a pretty good idea for how this peak looks. And when we put our RNA seq, or when we overlay our RNA seq data, we can see that you know in blue here's our control expression. And then in red is our knockout. 
So it appears to me that when you knock out SOX9, you actually get a decrease in expression of this gene. So that would indicate that binding of SOX9 here most likely drives expression, at least in the cells that this study was conducted on. So it's, it's really a great visual analysis tool, um, just the ability to combine all of these different types of files and analyses and carry out your own visual analysis. As an image like this would be great for publication, and actually uh, the publication that I pulled this data set from has an image almost just like this, we can go ahead and kind of make this look how we want. So keep in mind that Igby has a bevy of options to customize the look for however you want. So for instance, I can change, um, maybe I want to make this a different color in itself. I can go to more colors. I'm going to go with the green, make it stair step. And I'm actually going to change the Y axis manually. And if I don't want this coordinates track, I can just right click on that and I can hide it. And if you notice that uh, when I click here, there are things like this zoom stripe. We can also get rid of those. If you come up to view, you can hide individual um, visual tools, or you can just hide all of the visual tools. Get rid of that. And so if you then want to take a picture, if you're happy with how it looks, click on the camera icon. And here you can select from SVG, so a vector graphic, PNG, or JPEG. I'm going to leave it as PNG. Um, I'll just go ahead and leave this as this. Well, I'm going to change this to inches, and I'm going to put this at uh, higher resolution. Okay. So we'll go with kind of a high resolution. And then you can select between whole frame, which will save all of the information. So you'll see everything um, versus just the main view, which will just be this part, or the main view with labels. And so I'm going to go with the main view. And if I browse here, I'm just going to put it on my desktop. And then we can exit out of that. And so using this analysis, you know, you can really create um, whatever kind of graphics you want to demonstrate your data. Um, and if you wanted to, you could keep looking at other genes. Like I said, you know, if you wanted to back out and look at, uh, you know, the entire chromosome and go through and pick out more of these, you could. Once you found some genes that you're really interested in, though, and you wanted to concentrate on those genes, um, you can always, oh, let me get my coordinates track back, come in here and looking at this region, you can bookmark it. So if I come over here to the right and bookmarks, click on bookmarks, and then I can save this so I can make a new bookmark. And then I'm just going to put that there and say gene of interest. And so that way you can build up, um, you know, if you're looking at several genes or if you have several genes of interest, you can kind of build up that list. And that list of bookmarks you can actually export. So you can export those bookmarks and then import other people's bookmarks. So if you needed to share that list with colleagues or um, students, or if students wanted to share it with, with PIs or... Following this workflow, um, you can go from you know, your raw FASTQ data to align data very quickly and call peaks using Max. And then as we demonstrated here, you can create some really good graphics um, comparing your data, and it allows you to really easily jump between chromosomes in the genome and look for look through your different peaks and see what genes that they are close to. So it's just a really great tool to do this. And with that, I'll take any questions or comments. Oh, so Raj asked a question: How did you bring back the coordinates on Igby? Uh, it's a great question that that took me a while to, to remember. Um, so if you right-click over here in the tracks and then you go to show, 
and there should be the option, um, whatever you've hidden should be listed here. So you can select an individual thing or you could select all. So if I, if I hide this coordinates track, then I right click again, it'll appear here. Okay, so uh, Anne brought up a good point. If you want to rename some of these tracks, what you can do is come down to data access uh, and obviously I have got a lot loaded here. I'm going to just get rid of some of these really fast. But let's say I didn't want this shifted merge max tag counts for every, you know, that, that's kind of a, a lengthy thing, uh, especially if I want to take an image of this and I actually want to use these labels. So under the data access tab, I can come down here to track name and I can just change this to, let's just say max tags. And so you'll see that changes here. And then the same for this, you know, this kind of lengthy uh, description here. Maybe we want to change this to something just like the peaks. Uh, so Raj asked another good question. So how do we highlight a small portion region of interest of the main frame for a snapshot? Um, it, it really comes down to just viewing what you want to take a picture of, if that makes sense. So there's not necessarily a way to, to kind of you know, drag and highlight just a region you you want to take a picture of. So you do really have to kind of build that image um, however you want. You know, so if I if I don't want this to be here, or if I want it to be in a different place, then you know you can drag and drop it, or go ahead and hide it. Um, and if I just want you know a view of of this region, maybe then you know just go ahead and zoom in there. All right, well, if there's no more questions, then thank you so much for joining us.